Well, this morning we are concluding a three-week series titled Opportunity Costs. Now, it's not always easy to recognize the opportunities that are right in front of us. Now, on the screen behind me, you're going to see a picture. And do any of you know who this individual is? His name is Ronald Wayne. He was the third co-founder of Apple. Now, two weeks after Apple launched, he sold his share in the company, about 10%, forget this, $800. If he had held on to his share of the company, do you know what it would be worth today? About $40 billion. That's a pretty big miss. Now, he's not the only one in history to miss a great opportunity that was right in front of him. Check out some of these rather infamous prognostications. Here's a Western Union internal memo from 1876. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Here's another one. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. How about this one? The wireless music box has no imaginable commercial value. Who would pay for a message sent to no one in particular? And I love this great prediction from a professor of economics at Yale in 1929. Stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Mm, maybe a little wrong on that. How about the chairman of IBM in 1943? I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. And finally, Decca Recording Company rejecting the Beatles. We don't like their sound, and guitar music is on the way out. We don't always see the opportunities that are right in front of us. This morning, we're going to dive into one of Jesus' parables about opportunity. So we're going to read in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your minna has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your minna has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your minna. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his minna away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Let's pause a moment and pray. Lord, we worship you in this place. Oh God, there is no one like you, the living God. Lord, you make all things new. Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit this morning, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's make sure we understand the basic idea of this parable. Jews living in the first century were living with the expect expectation that God would soon come and bring his kingdom and elevate Israel through a newly divinely appointed king, the Messiah. 
They expected this to happen suddenly and dramatically. They thought this would be a political revolution, that in, the Isra enemies of Israel would be subdued and Israel herself would be exalted. Well, as it turned out, God's plan did not exactly fit into their expectations. Have you ever had that experience in life? Sometimes God doesn't do what we think he's going to do. Now, although Jesus was reestablishing God's kingdom through his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection, it wasn't coming about in the way that they were expecting. There was going to be a delay between his resurrection and the time when he would come and return to judge the nations and to exalt his people. And what Jesus explains is that in this interim period, we have great responsibilities and great opportunities. Great responsibilities and great opportunities. So let's dig it a little deeper. What's this parable teaching us? Well, firstly, it's telling us something about our identity, our identity. You know, to live properly in this life, we need to understand who we are. Identity drives behavior. Identity drives behavior. This starts at a very young age. Just watch children who dress up to play sometime. I mean, all of a sudden, they're transformed into different people. They start speaking differently. They start acting differently. And it doesn't take much. When I was a kid, I don't know about you, but I had superhero underwear. Anybody else? Okay, yeah, you won't admit it. I get it, but it was awesome. I would run through the house in my underwear feeling amazing. I actually kind of wish I had some superhero underwear today. So anyway, I'm going to be on the lookout. Now, you know, this effect doesn't end when we reach adulthood. Lots of research has indicated that the clothes that we wear affect how we behave. One study showed that when people put on a white coat that they associated with a medical professioner, professional, people started concentrating better. They had better focus. Their attention span lasted a longer period of time. I can remember the first time I put on football pads. I was pretty young, and I put on those shoulder pads and all those leg pads, and I just stood in front of the mirror and stared at myself for like five minutes. Man, I felt awesome. I mean, I was being transformed into a different person. And because I saw myself differently, I performed differently. It's our identity that drives our behavior. Notice the language that the Apostle Paul uses when he writes to the Ephesians. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, our identity changes. And we're not supposed to put, clothe ourselves with superhero underwear or football equipment, but we're to clothe ourselves with this new life that has been created to be like God in holiness and righteousness. Identity is an absolutely fundamental issue. There's perhaps few questions more important in life than who am I? Who am I? Look at the beginning of Romans chapter 1 with me. Notice how Paul begins this letter. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul identifies himself four different ways in one verse. He begins with the obvious Paul. Now, we should not overlook the significance of this. See, the, the name Paul was the Roman version of the Jewish name Saul. The very reason that he went by Paul told us something about Paul's mission. He was called to the Gentiles. That's why he went by the name Paul. And then he goes on to say, servant of Christ Jesus. He knew whom he was serving called to be an apostle. He recognized, I'm a messenger. I've been sent by God. And then finally, set apart for the gospel of God. You know, Paul didn't preach to try to figure out who he was. He preached because he knew who he was, that he was called by God, that he was an apostle, that God had something for him. When my son Calvin was around eight years old, he started reading a book called How to Be a Genius didn't know it was that simple. You just pick up a book, and then you can become a genius. So he's reading this book, 
And one day, uh, after working on some math homework, he came to me and said, hey, Dad, check out this math problem that I just did. I had to add up 99 plus 88 plus 77 plus 66. And I thought, well, each of those numbers are just multiples of 11. And since 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 is 30, I just needed to figure out what 30 11s is. Well, I know what 10 11s is. That's 110. And 30 is just 3 times 10. So therefore, 100, uh, 30 11s is 330. Now, he was eight years old. So I said to him, Calvin, wow, that's pretty clever, buddy. And he said, of course, I'm a genius. <laughs> because he saw himself as a genius now from reading this book, he expected himself to come up with great ideas. Now, Jesus' parable implicitly tells us something about our identity, which determines how we should behave. And so who are we? Who are we according to this parable? Well, Jesus says, we are servants. Jesus is the king, and we are servants. Now, this reality might require some of us to adjust our thinking a little bit. Have you ever noticed that we tend to be at the center of our own dreams? About a week ago, a man named Shane Lowry won the oldest of the majors in golf, the Open Championship. Now, Shane Lowry is Irish, and for the first time in 68 years, the Open Championship was held in Northern Ireland. So when Shane Lowry is walking down the 18th fairway, the crowd was going crazy. I mean, the weather was terrible. It was rainy, nasty out there. Didn't matter. People were going nuts as they watched their own countrymen win this championship. Now, have you ever noticed that growing up, nobody ever dreams of being the caddy for the person who wins the major? That's never how the dream goes. It's never something like Shane Lowry sinks the putt and the caddy grabs the pin and puts it back into the hole and the crowd goes wild. That's not how the dream goes. We're always at the center and therefore we need to readjust our thinking. We need to readjust our thinking. We're servants. We exist to build the kingdom and the fame and the glory of somebody else. We don't call the shots. Jesus calls the shots. And therefore, the most important question in life is not what do I want. Rather, it should be, Jesus, what do you want? What do you want, Jesus? We're called to be his servants. Now, you might think that having such a perspective on our own identity might be repressive or demeaning or maybe even psychologically harmful in some way, but actually the exact opposite is true. We were not made to be at the center of the universe. When we try to be our own God, it will crush us. Jesus needs to be at the center, and we are his servants. We need to follow the example of the Apostle Paul. He wrote this to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are servants. Now, secondly, the king expects us to go to work for him. The king expects us to go to work for him. In this parable, a man of noble birth entrusts 10 minas to 10 of his servants, and then he says to them, put this money to work until I come back. Well, what is Jesus getting at here? It's the reality that we are called to reach, to expand the reach and the influence of God's kingdom. We are called to expand the reach and the influence of God's kingdom. Have you noticed that some companies and brands don't just have customers, they have followers? Take LaCroix, for instance. Anybody here like LaCroix? I found that people who like LaCroix get really excited about LaCroix. If they have you over to their place, they can't wait to offer you LaCroix. Just cracking open a can of LaCroix starts to make them real happy on the inside. It's almost like they've forgotten that LaCroix is essentially barely flavored carbonated water. <laughs> now, the Twitterverse has, started, has tried to bring some kind of sanity this, to this whole situation. Listen to a couple of these observations. LaCroix tastes like your actual drink is still loading. <laughs> 
The Croix tastes like someone ate a fruit salad and then burped into your water bottle. <laughs> I guess the question I have for people who love LaCroix is, have you tried any other beverages? <laughs> LaCroix tastes like it was made by a society in which flavor is the scarcest <laughs> natural resource. <laughs> ah, human beings are amazing. <laughs> but none of this seems to matter. People love LaCroix. LaCroix has something like 170,000 Instagram followers. It's barely flavored carbonated water. 170,000 Instagram followers. I don't know. Sometimes people get this way about their favorite grocery store. Oh, you like the hummus? Trader Joe's. <laughs> I got this salad dressing for like 12 cents at Aldi. And also these socks and that alarm clock over there. <laughs> oh, you like the food tonight? It's all Wegmans. I didn't cook any of it. And what about Apple. Oh man, people go nuts for Apple. I remember when the original iPhone came out. Anybody have the original iPhone? All right, so I talked to this guy a few months after it comes out. He looks at me like a transformed man. And he holds up his phone and he says, this phone changed my life. <laughs> now none of these people are employees of these companies and yet they're taking it everywhere they're taking it everywhere where they go do you know that we've been in, we've been given the message of the kingdom and the values of the kingdom and the life of the kingdom and jesus is telling us to take it everywhere we go he's putting that capital into our hands and saying put it to work put it to work we pray how Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we take action to, br to bring God's kingdom and his will everywhere that we go. Now, how do we figure out what this looks like practically? Well, here's a great question to ask. Jesus, what do you want? Jesus, what do you want? In my family, Jesus, what do you want? In my workplace, Jesus, what do you want? In my neighborhood, Jesus, what do you want? In my city, Jesus, what do you want? We need to pursue Jesus until his heart starts to get on the inside of us, and then we take steps to bring it into action. We need to pursue Jesus. Now, as Jesus makes clear in this parable, sometimes this requires us to take a risk. Sometimes we've got to take risks. He says in verses 20 and 21, Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your minna. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. This servant rejected the responsibility of multiplying what was given to him and just chose the safer path, the one that didn't seem to be risky at all. And many times in our own lives, because of fear, we just don't do anything. Now, I don't know about you, but overall, I'm a cautious person, right? I don't want to make enemies. I want people to like me. And I know many other people feel that way too. And so we need to remember one of the most important principles in the kingdom in order to truly live, we need to die first. In order to really live, we need to die first. Listen to what Jesus says. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels." So here's the reality. We cannot ultimately serve more than one thing. You just can't live your life ultimately for more than one thing. Eventually, your loves, your desires, as Jesus puts it, your masters are going to come into conflict with one another. And so we may try, but it's impossible. Jesus made precisely this point in a passage that we unpacked last week. 
Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is not saying here that we should literally hate our families. He's using hyperbole to make the point that ultimately we can only live for one thing. We can only have one master. We are to live for Jesus Christ and him alone. Many of us get overwhelmed in life because we're trying to live for so many different things. We're trying to please all the time our children maybe, or our bosses, or our friends, or our spouses, or maybe we're trying to live up to the expectations of our culture. But see, Jesus narrows all of our responsibilities down to one. We are to live for him and him alone. And when we live for Jesus, he will make clear how we should live in all these other areas of our lives. You know, you'll never be free to take real risks for the kingdom until you die to your own expectations in life, many of your own dreams, many of the comforts that you pursue. See, so many times our lives shrink down and get so small because we live only for ourselves. But when we can die to those things, then, friends, we really come alive to live for something so much bigger than ourselves. And when we start to take risks, life gets exciting. When you're willing to take risks, you'll start to see opportunities all around you. I've been doing a lot of flying recently, and on a recent flight, I was seated in the very last row in a middle seat. I kind of felt like the airline should be paying me for going on this flight. And as it turns out, I was sitting next to this woman who is a professor of psychology at a nearby university, and she also was an adherent of a somewhat strange and eclectic spiritual movement called Science of Mind. Now, side note, whenever you hear the word science used in context like this, you can be pretty confident that you're not actually going to encounter any real science. It's kind of like when you see a restaurant called Tasty Buffet. If you have to put the word in your name, then it's probably not true of your food. Anyway, so she starts telling me about science of mind and how everything around us is really an illusion. It's all about your energy and you projecting reality uh, outside of you. And she's going on and on. So I ask her, well, what do you think about Jesus? And the next thing you know, I've got my Bible app opened and we're talking about the historical evidence for Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. It was a simple question, a simple step, but it turned into a great opportunity. Friends, when we die to ourselves and we're willing to take risks, we'll start to see opportunities all around us. Is it a, is it a risk to live out your faith at work? Yeah, oftentimes. Is it a risk to talk to your neighbor about Jesus? Sometimes. Is it a risk to become a foster parent? Definitely, but it's worth it. It's worth it to take risks for God's kingdom. Jesus' disciples took all kinds of risks, and so sometimes they did experience pain or disappointment or frustration, but they also saw incredible things. Friends, we need to take risks for the kingdom of God. You cannot start really living until you start taking risks for God. Fourthly, this parable reminds us that this life is preparation for the next life. This life is preparation for the next life. Jesus told the people, the man of noble birth was made king and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your minna has earned 10 more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. See, sometimes we get this idea that there's a total disconnect between our existence in this life and our future existence in the new heavens and the new earth. We just imagine sort of floating around in clouds, maybe listening to harp music. It all sounds very boring or maybe what you would do like, I don't know, in a retirement community or something. It doesn't sound very interesting, but this is not the reality. The next life is full of excitement and exploration and culture and learning. 
name. And Jesus is making the point here that what we do in this life impacts how we will experience reality in the next life. Now, I want to make a couple of important remarks. Firstly, it's important for us to understand that talents, opportunities, circumstances differ greatly in this life. But God does not reward us based on what we do with what we don't have, but based on what we do with what we do have. I mean, our circumstances can affect all sorts of um, the the level of which we're going to experience outward fruitfulness. So, for example, if you're a believer in a nation like, say, North Korea, that's really going to impact the level of fruit that you can bear. Or maybe you're a parent of a severely handicapped child. Or maybe you never had access to education in your life. All of those things will impact your level of outward fruitfulness. But friends, God does not reward us based on what we do with what we don't have, but what we do with what we do have. Our God is faithful and just. And if you will be faithful and take risks right where you are, God will reward you with great opportunity in the next life. Secondly, faithfulness with our responsibilities in this life leads to greater responsibility in the next life. Now, oftentimes, we try to avoid responsibility. But do you know we were made for it? We were made for it. This is how the Christian life begins. You take responsibility for your own sin, and you repent from it. This is how you grow in life. You take responsibility for your attitude and your actions and your own personal development. This is what leadership is all about, taking responsibility for something bigger than yourself. See, we're living in a cultural moment in which nobody wants to take responsibility for anything. Don't fall into that trap. Don't fall into that trap. We were made to carry responsibility. And if we are faithful in this life with the opportunities that God brings to us, we will be rewarded rewarded with great opportunity and great responsibility in the next life. Finally, although we are servants, we are not merely servants. Although we are servants, we are not merely servants. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells his disciples, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. When we follow Jesus, we become sons and daughters of the King. And he tells us that the Father is pleased to give the kingdom to us. In fact, the night before he died, Jesus told his disciples, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. A few hours later, Jesus gave his life for us. Friends, there's a gap. There's a gap between Jesus' resurrection and his triumphant return, which we look forward to. And this gap is filled with responsibility and opportunities. And we need to understand who we are. God has sent us on mission. We are to expand the influence and the reach of God's kingdom. To do this, we've got to take some risks sometimes. God has called us to take risks. And if we will be faithful now, oh, we can't imagine the things that God has for us. Let's take advantage of the opportunities that God is raising up all around us. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we worship you in this place. Father, there is no one like you. Jesus, there's no king like you. Lord, you tell us so many challenging things. But Lord, then you laid down your life for us so that we can walk in them. And just while we're in this moment of prayer, maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I want that life. I want to follow Jesus. I want my life to matter. I want to live for something bigger than myself. I need forgiveness of my sins, and I want to embrace the purpose and the mission that God has for me. If that's you today, I want to encourage you to take a very simple but important step I want to encourage you to grab one of the cards and the seat backs in front of you and to take a moment to fill it out and to, on the back of that card, indicate today, I am making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. 
Lord, I thank you that when we take this step, you are right there to meet us. Lord, that you're working on the inside of us. Lord Jesus, that your resurrection life comes alive on the inside of us and you renew us and you strengthen us, Lord, to deny ourselves and to live for something bigger than our own lives. Thank you, God. When we trust you, you will take care of us. You'll provide for us and you will lead us into your purposes. So God, we say, have your way. Make us a fruitful people. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give him praise today, church?